Disney is really taking a big step into the whole TCG world, community environment, whatever you want to call it, with Lorcana. And there's a lot of similarities between it and Magic the Gathering. As someone who spent like a decade playing Magic the Gathering now, and as a fan of some key Disney properties, I'm intrigued. I'm genuinely interested in what this game has to offer. If nothing else, it's competition and it can help shake up the landscape. Maybe make Magic better trying to compete. For those of you at home, that means you know how to play Magic and you're interested in learning how to play Lorcana. So this is my guide on how to play. I'm gonna be using a lot of Magic slang and drawing a lot of parallels between the two games just to make this whole process easier for you. Starting off with deck building. Deck building seems pretty familiar. It's a 60 card deck. You can only run max four of each card. Then we get to the ink types. There are six ink types in Lorcana and they function kind of similar to the colors in magic. There's amber, emerald, sapphire, amethyst, ruby, and steel. You may have noticed that there's six of them rather than five in magic, so that they don't perfectly line up with each color. Amber is focused on alliances and friendship. It works with a lot of healing and works with a lot of smaller creatures, which is pretty directly white. Emerald and sapphire both seem to play in different parts of red. Sapphire focuses on dealing lots of damage and then dealing extra damage, which is fairly red but this game isn't directly one through dealing damage. Emerald, however, is focused on going fast. So there you can see that connection. Amethyst is all about control. You're drawing cards and disrupting what your opponent is doing. You might typically think blue. I like to think like maybe like Esper, that kind of idea. Ruby is supposed to be of a support role for advantages. Advantages in drawing cards, gaining lore points, uh, maybe even ramping. It sounds like how green can kind of be in some decks. And then steel is described as the brute force color. You're going big. This is the traditional idea of green stompy. When building your deck, you're actually limited by your color choices. Your decks can only include up to two ink types. You can have one, but you can do two as well. So I touched on it earlier about how damage isn't necessary for winning in this game. So let's get to some of the gameplay. In a game, instead of working towards dealing 20 damage to your opponent, you're working towards gaining 20 lore points for yourself. And then you'll also win if your opponent decks themselves. Side note, also when you're starting a game, there's also a weird way to mulligan in this game. You're doing hands of seven like you would in Magic. But there's a thing called altering your hand. It works similar to an old commander mulligan. You have your seven and then you put some of them back that you don't like and then you draw the rest up back up to seven. You can only do this once. Looking at how a turn works, it looks a lot like magic. Instead of untap, upkeep, draw, we have ready, set, draw which are pretty much the exact same steps. The next thing to cover is the inkwell and playing cards into your inkwell. So your inkwell is pretty much your mana pool. And I'd argue that this is one of the bigger things that separates this from magic. Don't get me wrong, it's very similar, but there's some key features that make it different. In this game, there are no lands, but instead you play cards from your hand face down. You reveal a card from your hand and as long as it has that special ring up there, that means you can do this. You can play it face down and use it to make mana or ink in this game. But once you've played it into your inkwell, that's it. It has no other effects except for making ink and you can't like bring it back, use it later for something else. The next step that makes it different from Magic the Gathering is there's no color differences. You aren't gonna get screwed over for playing an amber steel deck where you have a card that's really committed to amber and all you've drawn is steel lands. That's not how this works. All cards make just one generic style of mana, but to stop you from just making five color good stuff, you can only run two colors or two inks. You can use all ember cards to cast a steel shivan dragon, whereas you couldn't use all forests to cast a magic shivan dragon. Once you've actually put the card into the inkwell, it's just like magic and lands. To play a card, you look up top for its mana cost and then you tap that many lands for it. But instead of lands, you're exerting your ink wells. See, you can see how it's similar, but also different. There are four other things you can do on your turn. You can play a card. We just learned how to pay for a card, so now we know how to play cards. There are three card types. We've seen characters that are pretty much one-to-one -one with creatures in Magic the Gathering. Then there are items, which are very similar to artifacts in Magic the Gathering. And then there's actions, which line up mostly with sorceries. Notably in this game, everything is done at sorcery speed. You can't cast your spells on your opponent's turn. You can't activate your abilities on your opponent's turn. At least not yet. Also notable, there's a subtype to actions called songs. 
The special thing about songs is you can pay an alternative cost to get them out for cheap. This usually just means tapping a creature or exerting a, a character in this <laughs> game um, that has a CMC that's either equal or higher. So playing a card was the first of four. The second of four is using an item ability. I mentioned earlier that they're similar to artifacts. You can activate items on your turn. Remember, there's no such thing as instant speed, so make sure you do it on your turn and don't mess up and think, oh, I'll just do it on their end step. The third thing you can do on your your turn is using a character's ability that doesn't cause it to exert. There's a parallel to summoning sickness in this game, which is basically the Ludo narrative behind it is that the ink hasn't dried. So if the activated ability on a card requires for it to exert itself, it can't do it the turn it comes out. And then the fourth thing you can do on your turn is exerting a creature if it has an ability that exerts or you can exert it in another way. There's a couple different ways to exert a creature. Certain activated abilities will straight up have it as part of its cost that you have to exert it. It'll include that little tap symbol. There's questing. Questing is how you win in this game. You exert in a creature and gain lore equal to its lore value, which is down at the side. I have a finger pointing to it. So looking at them here, if you exerted King Triton, you'd gain two lore. And remember, you're trying to get to 20. But you don't want to be exerting your creatures all the time willy-nilly because that's where combat actually comes into this game. One thing you can do with one of your characters is challenging an opponent's character. You can only challenge a character if it's exerted. To challenge, you have to exert your character, so you basically just tap it. You can only target something that's already exerted, and then they both deal damage to each other equal to their power. A big way that combat differs between this and magic is that damage stays on the card. If my opponent has exerted their Gaston, I could take my King Triton and challenge Gaston. And let's just say for this example, Gaston has no damage on him already. Gaston is banished, and then King Triton has four damage marked on him. And he can't lose that four damage unless I have a card that says he does. I think this should lead to some interesting gameplay. You have your creatures that are just here to try to get you to your goal of 20 lore. You have your creatures that are here that are more so trying to accrue value, draw you more cards, pump up your other creatures. And then you have creatures here that are just beaters. They're here to make sure that your opponent's creatures don't get too out of hand. And it's not like magic. I can't just throw down an 8-8 and dominate the board because eventually that 8-8 is gonna be an 8-0. So now you know how a turn goes, how to play your cards, what the six colors mean, you're pretty much set. There's a lot of overlap here, so I imagine a lot of the skills and mindsets you've picked up from playing Magic the Gathering can be transferred over. But there are a few things I feel like would take some practice, maybe even just for muscle memory. Like a common tactic in Magic is to hold onto your cards until the last possible second, just to make sure you're efficiently using your removal or something similar. But here, you can't do stuff on your opponent's turn, so you might as well just cast it now. There's also the idea of building a mana base, and Magic in a 60 card deck, you usually run around 24 lands, but I imagine that number will vary here. You might want to run more just so you're consistent, but that also means if you start to flood, you could just cast these cards instead. I hope this has been helpful. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to bolt your birds or or bippity boppity your booze or bippity boppity boo your eagos.